Uh, hi, I'm Dave Bradbury, Planet Wash. Hello, pleased to meet you. How are you I'm, doing? Uh, talking to John Coughlin, ex Quo, and now John Coughlin's. Uh, John Coughlin's Quo. Yeah. Uh, welcome, John. Um, just like to ask you a few questions about your time with Status Quo, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, how did it uh, How did it all begin for you, Quo? Well, at school, um, I remember being in uh, the secondary school, which I hated. And um, a friend of mine had a badge on his lapel, and he, I said, what's that, Steve? And he said, it's an um, air training corps. He said, do you like aeroplanes? I said, yeah, I do. And he said, you'd, you'd enjoy it, you know, come along. So I was you know, about 15, I suppose. I don't know. And uh, I joined the air cadets and went flying, and um, down at Tangmere in Cologne, and um, great memories of that. Then mum and dad were great dancers, and they used to take me to Crystal Palace Hotel in South London, near where we lived. And they'd have big bands on, big dance bands, and they used to watch the drummer. And I thought, yeah, I reckon I can do that. Um, and so my dad brought me a little drum kit, a little Broadway, you know, cheap little drum kit, and I sort of practiced at home. And the first gig I ever did was really hilarious because it was um, in a pub called the Two Towers in West Norwich. And someone said, why don't you come bring the drums down and play with the pianist? And they, anyway, my dad, somehow we got the kit down there because my dad didn't have a car so he probably carried it and um, we sat there and there was this woman playing piano and me on drums and when I think about it now it probably sounded horrendous <laughs> no, no bass player no vocals you know and then they said would I do it again the next week anyway we used to in the air cadets which is obviously much later there were two guys play guitar and so we put a little trio together in the squadron and we'd rehearse there on Sundays then uh, two guys knocked on the door, can we come and listen? Yeah, yeah, that's right, come in, no problem. And they sat there and we, then they asked us again the next week and um, then they put, pl plucked up courage to ask me if I'd um, join their band. And I remember going in a taxi, which my dad got me, come with me down to Forest Hill in South London to this house. There was a, a guy called Jesse Wolski and he played keyboards. And it was him on keyboards, Francis on guitar and um, Anna Lancaster. So you guessed, you know, that was the start of status quo, or not status quo in that sense, but it was purely by us playing in the squadron drill hall and then rehearsing in the TA hall across from the building. And they heard us play, we heard them play, and um, from then on they said, oh yeah, you know, you, you, it's great, would you join? In fact, I think I may have made that bit up because I'm sure that I just stayed. <laughs> I wasn't really asked. And they said, oh, he's got a bigger drum kit than the other bloke. So, yeah, you're all right. <laughs> and that's how it started. And I think really we had loads of different names. Jerry, a gas fit of bloke said he wanted managers. And it was really funny because he had a basement in Lambeth Walk. And we used to practice in the basement, in you know, filthy basement. But you know, hey, it, it paid off, you know, and it was yeah. great fun. And, um, I worked on it. Yeah. yeah, but see, you don't know anything else, do you, really? That if you enjoy playing uh, an instrument and uh, played an audience, which is half the battle. And that's what, you know, I think every musician has a bit of exhibitionism, you know? exhibitionism, mm -hmm. um, to be able to sort of, if you like, show off in front of an audience and, and play well. And that's all we ever did, you know, then. Uh, Pat Barlow said, I've got a name for the band, Status Quo. Oh, I don't like that. What's that? Oh, it means as you are. Is it? Oh, <laughs> that'll do. And then the rest is history, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel sorry for a lot of bands these days, because it's like the rock and roll thing, it's not quite the big scene anymore since so Top of the Pops and Lights finished there. It's, yeah. it, it's really hard for them. And I remember doing, you know, with Top of the Pops, I think the first one we ever did would have been in Manchester. Yeah. and it was pictures of matchstick men and in those days bands that um, charted and then you got the phone call they're going to be on top of the pops it was like a, a horrendous massive sort of leap like wow we're going to be on telly you know yeah. and um, in those days I remember they put the drums in the front and the band behind it was yeah. a bit odd and no, no one plays like that no. then I think they moved it to uh, was it to White City and it went to um, Shepherd's Bush oh Shepherd's Bush then White City I think that and we did some pop, top of the pops a lot in those days, and it was always great fun. Yeah. You know? And because in those days, if you did top of the pops, 
with a bit of luck you get in the charts and if you get in the charts you get loads of gigs. So it's exposure isn't it? Yeah. These kids don't go in the expos, lots of problems. The thing is what happened when we, we did Matchstick Man, Black Bells, Man Collie, and I think it was in the Sun, but we was like really poppy and then we didn't have any more hits and you didn't get any gigs. And it, it was really sort of Bob Young who plays on my record and writes a lot of songs and um, you know he suggested getting rid of the full shirts and jackets and drying their hair and starting all over again, reinvented ourselves when it paid off. Because yeah, yeah. we played everywhere, you know, clubs, pubs, really uh, anywhere that had a bar. Yeah, it's the essence, isn't it? You've got, you've got the BUV really soul for it. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, it's cool. And it was good, and um, just, we didn't want to give it up. We didn't want to say, oh, that's it, you know, we won't play anymore. And we thought, no, no, we're enjoying it. We're enjoying this, we carry on. And Bob was right, you know, long hair, t-shirts and jeans. Yeah. And we, we did that, and it paid off. But, I remember playing some tiny little gigs, the Red Line, Leightonstein, um, the, the Way Calms and Epic. Because they were like my pub who played in yesterday, my band. That's how it all starts, it just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. And you build it up. Yeah. And what you're saying about some of these new bands, I mean, they, have they got anywhere to play? You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I go to Germany and Holland a lot to play because there's more gigs out there. You know? I think we've got a lot of festivals over there, don't we? Yeah. So there's more festivals for you, it's getting into the festival because that's what people want to get into. It's really, really hard for them. Well, I think we're doing one in Northampton soon, and we're doing one in Bakewell. We're doing another festival in Vista in Oxfordshire. You know, and I think it's great, you know, even if it's only 500 people or 10,000, it's it's such a buzz to be able to be, able to be asked to go and do it. You know, and we've, we've got a loyal following. and. Um, there's loads of pro fans come to my gigs, oh. and I, I think really, if someone said to me yesterday how much they love uh, all the status quo music and, and my band, and I think, uh, as I've said before, you know, it's all the, the Frantic Four tour we've just done. And that's all really up down to the fans in a way, because it's them that wanted it, and they bought the tickets and made it happen. Yeah. So it's thanks to them really. <laughs> well, I want to ask you about. Um Making the live album, Glasgow. God, that was years ago. Yeah, 1976, 77. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, we had fond memories of, of that um, gig because, uh, well, Glasgow audience, you know, what can you say? Fantastic. And um, we all remember the three or four balconies bouncing. Yeah, you oh, know, and we're looking, that, yeah. watching it and we're thinking, it's going to go. Well, gonna, oh. Thank God it didn't, you know. Um, and it was such a shame they pulled that gig down. And uh, there's another gig there, but somewhere else. Uh, it's like the Marquee in Wardour Street. That's gone. Yeah. That was, you know, everyone that's had a name played the Marquee, and it's turned into a bloody restaurant. <laughs> you know, so yeah. but uh, Glasgow Polo was one of their favourite gigs, and uh, it was an excellent album. One of my favourite. You like that? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I'd like to play some of the things yesterday. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, and it, I've noticed over the years that there's so many young fans come along to concerts with their dads yeah. and they've said, you know, oh, we love all the early clothes stuff. And the kid's probably only 16, yeah. you know, and they listen to all their dad's albums and they've gone, yeah, this is, this is brilliant. And they're going to go and, sit and to go and see the band do it again. Oh, it's, it's nice and inspiring people to do it, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. You know, like I say, it's all those fans that kept it going. Because if they, you know, if they weren't there, they, they wouldn't be these. They wouldn't be the band, you know. So um, it, it, it's great, and we really pre appreciate the, those bands following us and make it happen. Really. What's, um, what's your particular favourite album? Well, do you always get asked that? Yeah. Even when I was oh, with, yeah. <laughs> a, with a band, and I, I can't really say. I don't know. I mean, people say Dog or Two Head, yeah. Blue for You. But like different songs and different albums. Yeah, but it was all sort of, in a sense, bands. Uh, I would always just say, oh, obviously the last album is the best one, because yeah. that's the, the freshest and newest album. But, uh, so you're going to have to ask the Quone fans, because they know more than us, I think, from an outside point of view. Yeah. We could be biased because we're in the band, oh no, that's a better album than that one. And, you know, I don't know, we've made so many albums, um, I, I, I should really say they're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. 
what if after about um, what happened after the split? No, I, I um, after the split, I um, went back to the Isle of Man where I was living at the time, yeah. and I was sort of Colin Johnson was the manager those days, and he said I think he was near enough to having a nervous breakdown, you know, too much partying, too much touring, um, and I think what I did was um, just get out of the game, and I went to the Isle of Man, and I. Um, I uh, didn't touch a drum kit for a year. Yeah, yeah. and I had, at that time I had quite a few drum kits at home. Uh, I just looked at them and went, you know, um, I'm not going to uh, play for a while. And um, because then what happens is, once you're out the frame, you sort of lose contact. But I think health-wise, it was better for me to get out for a while. Then, oh, I'm actually playing again, you know, and that's quite hard because then you find out who your friends are, yeah. you know, in the business. And uh, it was tough, but got on with it. And, um, you know, and uh, it's all turned around for the, for the best for me, you know. Yeah. And uh, really good fun. And uh, plans to go it forward into 2015? Well, yeah, I mean, I had this question yesterday yeah. when I would be doing the gig in my pub, but... Um, well, we don't want to retire into chat. No, no, well, I, I've always had the same musicians and actors and the like don't really retire, just fall off the perch. <laughs> you know, that, that's the way I look at it, and I think really, um, I don't I don't want to stop playing, I enjoy it, you know, I enjoy yeah. it such a lot. Um, just, you know, I just enjoy playing drums. I've still got my original lovely kit from 1960, I think it's 65, I've got that kit, and I'm um, still playing it. You know, and yeah, yeah. Is know. that the pearl one? No, it's the um, lovely super classic ah. with a, a Yamaha snare drum. Yeah. And in fact, I used the Yamaha snare drum on the quote tour, both tours, the, the Frantic Four tours, because I've stuck to one snare drum and it's got that unique sound that I like and I, won't, I don't really want to use another snare drum. Because you, you always find, especially if you're using someone else's kit, say, yeah. you know, in Holland, Prague, let's say. Um, it, might, it certainly won't be tuned the same way I tune my snare drum. And so I think, no, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to do that, I'll take mine. And it works every time. So good. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was it like getting back with the lads for this last tour? It was great. This one, I, I would say, was um, much, much better than the last tour. Yeah. We were having more fun on stage this time. More relaxed. Me and Francis were sort of laughing at each other all the time. And, just clowning about and it really took me back to the old days that's how it was we were just always like that and um, you know and I I came off that tour in Dublin uh, and we flew back to uh, Heathrow went home and you know I felt exactly the same as I do now I, I, I was thinking 16 shows I'm gonna be whacked out you know and not at all it was fine and I actually think um, the tour did me a lot of good because yeah. I had a a, a previous problem with my shoulder, a rotator cuff syndrome, and I actually see my doctor, and I was really worried. And we did two weeks rehearsal, and I actually he gave me a jab in there, in there, and he hit the spot. And all the playing I did, I think, made everything work. You know, it was for the best, and now it, it's fine. <laughs> so uh, if you've got a problem with your shoulder, go and play drums. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, military vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, it all started with a friend of mine in Iver Buckinghamshire. I used to do a lot of um, off-road racing with a club called the All-Wheel Drive Club many years ago. It was four by fours and mud, really. Yeah. And um, then things used to break. Then I did a comp safari, which is speed trials. And of course, not being a mechanic, most of those guys that did that were mechanics had their own garage, and they used to sort of repair it and if I broke something I'd have to get someone to fix it. Then I went to Ivor in Buckinghamshire with Richard Beddle was a great friend and he showed me this row of Bedford QLs, World War II trucks. And I remember my dad was in the army in the war and he, he showed me bits of Bedford when I was very young. And then he said, Do you want to drive one up to Duxford next week? We're taking all four up to Duxford and that's a bit you know famous as a museum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ex military base but um, yeah, we drove them up there and I joined the club. And it was something, you know, a lot of musicians love sports cars. Yeah. I've always been into trucks of all sizes, especially American trucks. And uh, then the military trucks came on the scene 
and I joined, the, it was called the Military Vehicle Conservation Group, started by a gentleman called Peter Gray in Worthing. And he had this vision of um, all these vehicles laying dormant. And so he rescued a few, started the club, and everyone else joined it. Then it became Military Vehicle Trust much later. And I think there's around about 7,000 members in the club. And they've got the club in it. It's probably got everything from the folding bicycle, which are paratroopers use, up to tanks. And some people have got kit like that. Yeah, they can yeah. take them to big shows. But it's like everything else, they've probably got, most of them got transport firms with low loaders. They yeah, chuck it on the back and off they go. Expensive Yeah, and I've, got, I've had a load, loads of different vehicles. I've, I had a lovely Humber Snipe once when I was in the Isle of Man. That was in Yanks, the TV series. Uh, I've had a Bedford, I've had a you know, Volvo, Suggo, I've had all sorts of military vehicles. Yeah. And now I've just got a French Tsunkamama, which has a 4.2 litre side valve engine, V8 petrol. And basically it's a bit like the German Union mod. And um, it's a bit of kit that I like, you know. Yeah, it's got about, isn't it? Yeah, it's good fun. And the club's great. And it, the Military Vehicle Trust doesn't really care what you do for a living, yeah. you know. No, it's got quite special it, it, We all pitch up in certain places in the country throughout the year. And this one being in the Cotswolds is, is tucked away. Yeah. And a lot of the lads camp out or they sleep in the wagons and, uh, you know, we put barbecues on. And we, uh, oh. no, don't start. <laughs> Edit point. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I went, I went to. Um, <laughs> it's the dog. I went to Mumby uh, from years ago. Oh yeah. Uh, to Lincolnshire. Yeah. And it was every vehicle you could think of. It, you, know, you couldn't believe it. We just thought it was just something like a little display thing. But it was tanks. Can't remember the things that we wanted. Ducks. Thank you. Um, the, the vehicles there. The captain carrying one. Jeeps. Everything. Tractor pulling. Steam engines. Oh, yeah, that was a steam rally. No, no, it was proper. Mumby, um, it just said Mumby 4, uh, four by 4 that's on wheels or something. Yeah, that's, um, it would have, would have been a combination between steam yeah. tractors and military, so it would have been anything that's 4x4. Four four, four, uh, jet, jet bikes and all sorts. Yeah. Oh, anything to do with wheels, it was there. Good yeah. fun. Fantastic weekend. It was, it was the only time we went, and it was the only one we ever seen other time. Yeah. We were just squadron there. Right? There are some massive shows, there's uh, the War and Peace Revival, which is in Rochester, I think, um, RAF Western Hanger. That's a massive day, because where it is in Kent, there's um, everyone from Holland, Belgium, that part of the world, come to the show because yeah. they get on the ferry, or probably not through the tunnel, but on the ferry, and they spend two weeks there, or ten days, you know. Um, fabulous. Um, it's a bit, bit the, the show's a bit too big, really, for me, but. Um, there's all over the country, and you get some great shows in Holland as well. The Dutch have got some of the French, yeah. so it, it is a big hobby. And um, a lot of these vehicles are revived and being scrapped because a lot of stuff is scrapped. And a lot of the military, a lot of stuff goes up to um, Lincolnshire and gets sold off. Yeah. And so if you, you go up there, you could virtually buy anything that was um, ex-military. Yeah, you've got a big show at uh, Newark. Yeah, it just depends how deep your pockets are. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not cheap. Right, I can wait. <laughs> right, I mean, next question. Um, drum kits. We drum spoke about earlier. What was what's your, your best favourite setup? Well, the Ludwig that I used yesterday, the Ludwig Super Classic, um, is my favourite kit. Of course, Premier on the two tours yeah. lent me a, a Premier kit. With, uh, thanks to the Vida Seals and Symbols as well, they gave me another set of Symbols. Uh, and it was fantastic because you know, I, I was going to use the Ludwig on the first tour. Then Lance Miles, who was the drum tech, said, "Well, you can, but it's a vintage kit, and I don't, I'd worry about it getting damaged on tour." And so Premier said, well, "They'll give me the kit," and um, we've used it for two tours now. Um, I I used to have a Louis Belson Slingerland kit uh, when I was in the Isle of Man. That was a fantastic kit. I've had various premiers, of course. Uh, I've had a, a DL, DLW, I think it was that. Uh, yeah, I think it was, I can't remember now. It's very, very, very old. And uh, I had that for quite a few years. Uh, 
I've had so many kits I've forgotten, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. you move on and, yeah. and really it's down to storage and, and uh, you can only play one kit at a time. Yeah. 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 And that one you played yesterday was was that the No, that did. I've never owned a bell kit. No. Keep saying bell. No, I love it, super classic. <laughs> with the Yamaha snare and the Vida symbols. Vida yeah. symbols. Do you have any advice for, for your own drummer? Inspiring? Yeah, learn to play and keep time and make the band swing. That's what a drummer's job is supposed to be. And play with style, you don't know? bash the bloody thing. There's so many drummers that they just don't know how to play a ride cymbal, they just bash it. Um, favourite drummers have always been Louis Bells and Buddy Rich, Brian Bennett, Bobby Elliott. Um, just fantastic drummers with them. Um, they sort of play the drums musically somehow, other than just thrashing away and yeah. um, playing really for the song. You know, playing for the song, other than doing bloody drum solos through the guitar solo. You know, what's all that about? You know, like an example with the Rolling Stones, Charlie Watts lays it out. Charlie plays how he plays. He hasn't played it any different, and he plays it how the Stones want it. And that's all how things become successful. You know, I really couldn't, you know, an example like Led Zeppelin. I couldn't see another drummer in there other than John Bonham. I know his son did the um, um, last tour. But then he sorts his courses and it's like a lot of drummers have said, you know, I was the one with the quote because what we did when we first became known, we put a stamp on it. Mm. And so, you know, like with Charlie with the Stones, he's put his stamp on it. Yeah. And that's how it works, you know. John Bonham and Zepp Zeppelin, you know, at the, at the time when Zepp was formed, you know, I could never see another drummer other than John playing it because he, he put his stamp on it. He was the right man for that gig, you know. You can mm -hmm. say, you can say what you like, but you know, I know I'm bloody right because there's no other drummer. And I know, I know drummers could do it now, what John did, because we all copy each other, really. Um, but. Right from day one, you know, no, John was the man for that. Massive, you know. And I saw Zeppelin twice and thought, wow, he's the boy. Fantastic. <laughs> Sadly missed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not really. yeah. yeah. Come on. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. Been brilliant. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry the dog got in the way. Oh, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Good man. <laughs>